Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily. Then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take conversations with your fans to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. U.S. Navy History, arriving. Welcome to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I am joined by the EXO, Christoph. Hey, Christoph. Hey, good, good day. It's good, uh, good to be here. I'm very excited for what's about to happen today. And we are also joined by a third party. We are happy to have Craig Nelson with us, he is the uh, New York Times bestselling author of Pearl Harbor and the First Heroes, and he is here to talk about his new book, V is for Victory. Hi, Craig. How you doing? Thank you, guys, for having me. It's an honor to be here. We're, we're glad that you're here. So first off, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, anything you want everybody to know. Well, I have been writing uh, American history books for uh, 22 years now. Uh, my big bestseller was about uh, the Apollo 11 go history of going to the moon. That was called Rocket Man. But I've gotten quite a bit of acclaim for my military history. The first was on uh, called The First Heroes on the Doolittle Raid, which was a joint Army-Navy operation in World War II to take revenge on Japan for Pearl Harbor. And the second was a book called Pearl Harbor from Infamy to Greatness, which shows the background history of everything that happened such as that the median age of 100,000 people serving on Oahu was 18. So a lot of kids, people at Pearl Harbor were 16, 17 years old. And now um, uh, uh, Vias for Victory is sort of about the domestic side, the homeland side of World War II, and how everything had to be aligned so that uh, guys in uniform could have everything they needed at the front line. Wonderful, wonderful. So... Let's jump right in here. So what are the key elements of Franklin Roosevelt's American Revolution? So a lot of something that people really forget is how terrible shape the country was in in 1933 when he took office. Uh, let me give you some examples. A quarter of the nation was unemployed. People were chopping up pieces of their houses to have firewood to heat and cook with. Uh, People were dropping off their kids at orphanages because they couldn't afford to have them. When it came to the military, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, home to the biggest naval installation in the world right now, used to have a sign in its park saying, no dogs or sailors. And uh, uh, our, our army was being trained. If you were in a tank battalion, you had to learn how to use a tank without any tanks. They didn't have tanks to train people. So they would march information, five guys pretending to be in a tank. And if they were lucky, they got a least uh, good humor ice cream truck to pretend that was a tank. And this was the army that was going to have to be called on to beat Hitler. So we had a really long way to go. And part of it started with, uh, in 1938, Roosevelt was really worried that France and England had given Czechoslovakian land to Hitler as what was called appeasement strategy. And he decided that he didn't want to send any American lives into battle in Europe, but he did want to send American products that people would buy. 
to help both the economy and to help defeat Hitler. And so he started this operation to dramatically increase airplane manufacturing, warplane manufacturing in the U.S. in 38, three years before Pearl Harbor. And this became the arsenal of democracy, which was the industrial miracle that won the war. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I do remember uh, how our supply was so bad at the beginning. People wearing World War I era uniforms being just taken right out of the, uh, the back room. It really is astonishing to, it, it, it's so impossible since we have such an incredible military now to imagine that at any time it was really in the dumpster. I mean, uh, my favorite statistic is it, just before World War II, our military was 14th in size in the world between Portugal and Bulgaria. So, you know, join the U.S. Navy. We're bigger than Bulgaria. Doesn't sound like much of a public Those were bragging rights back then. <laughs> oh, yeah. So how, how did Franklin Roosevelt's revolution differ from other political revolutions in, in history? Well, if you take the way the country was in when he started in 33 and when he started, ended in 45, it, the difference is so incredible. It's a completely unrecognizable place. It's really the, almost the same as when we were a British colony and then became an independent nation. It is that dramatic a difference. So, for example, when uh, World War II started, the, the, the ruling empire was Britain. And when it ended, it was us. And when it started, we were a frightened, isolated, uh, scared, depressed bunch of people. And when it ended, we were the winners of the World War. So it just the difference in the two is just astonishing. And what I try to do in this story is in this book is show how the American people put aside their differences and we are politically at each other's throats then and such that people were fighting in the streets over politics. Uh, how they put aside their differences and came together and came out of this depressed, isolated sense to defeat both Adolf Hitler and the Great Depression. And to see them, see us coming together is almost as, it's like the most encouraging story I've ever read because you feel so much better about the nation, so much better about everything. It makes you feel deeply patriotic all over again. So how would Franklin have uh, described his revolution? Well, Roosevelt in real life, I mean, uh, as a politician, excuse me, Roosevelt as a politician was an awful lot like Ronald Reagan. And I think, in fact, that Ronald Reagan based his persona on Roosevelt, because I don't know if you remember, but Reagan would do this thing. We'd go, oh, there you go again. Ah, ha, ha, when people would criticize him, he was this very easygoing, happy-go-lucky uh, person. He liked everybody. He really felt everything was going to turn out just great. And this is exactly what Roosevelt was like. So Roosevelt so pretended to be this Every go, every day, easygoing kind of person that people couldn't understand that he was doing all this stuff politically. So one of his budget directors at the end of the war, he said, "Someone must have planned and run all this. Could it have been the president? Even the people who worked for him didn't understand how he was doing all this. So he wouldn't have said anything about it. He would have kept it as a secret." So can you go on a little bit more of his leadership style? So what Roosevelt did was he very carefully moved the country forward step by step, and he never got ahead of public opinion. He was one of the first presidents who used polling, and he would sort of try out his ideas for legislation by having people talk about it in public before he went forward in any way. And he could gauge how the public responded to speeches on the radio to decide what he should do next. And the great sort of example of this was called at its, in its time the Great Debate, and it took place between him and Charles Lindbergh. So most of us know Lindbergh as a great hero. He was the first man to fly across the Atlantic between New York and Paris. He did it all alone without a co-pilot. He did it using celestial navigation that he wasn't very good at. And he did it with his only flying experience, having been an airmail pilot. So this achievement just blew Americans' minds in the 1930s. He was literally the most famous and acclaimed American in the world. But then his life really turned sour. His baby was kidnapped and murdered, and it made him crazy. And he decided the fault was the United States in general. American society had killed his baby. So he left for Europe, 
And in Europe, he fell in with a bunch of people who thought the Nazis were going to take over the world and we might as well get on the bandwagon because there's no reason to be losers, just accept fate. And he got started touring the Luftwaffe and he started reporting that, you know, the Nazis are going to win. They're so much more powerful than anybody else. We should just give up right now. And then he came back to the United States to try and talk Americans out of fighting the Nazis. And this is where he ran up against Roosevelt, who was trying to talk Americans into fighting the Nazis. And the two of them would alternately appear on the radio and argue policy. And that's how this entire story moves forward. Americans listen to Lindbergh and Roosevelt debate their ideas. And that's how the American public got to take place and uh, take part in what was going on in the wider world. What would you say, or how would you say that Roosevelt's personal background influenced his uh, leadership? Well, his, um, he had been almost every political job you could have. He had been a state representative and he'd been governor of New York and he'd been assistant secretary of the Navy, as had Theodore Roosevelt. He and uh, Theodore had almost the exact same uh, uh, career track in every job. So he was very used to learning about how to use politics to uh, move things forward and to get things done. And he was very interested in experimenting because when he would see a giant problem like the national economy having collapsed, he would bring in people to do every single idea they could think of. And he said that if he had a 60% success rate, he would be happy. And I mean, I can't imagine a politician saying that now, you know, let's yeah. try everything. And if we fail 40% of the time, so what? But then people were so happy to have anything going on. Uh, there was a humorist who said, if, if FDR start, set the Capitol on fire, at least we'd say, well, at least he got a fire going. You know, that's how desperate people were. <laughs> oh, boy. So let's uh, get into World War II a little bit. So what are some of the key military strategies that Roosevelt helped with their development. So as far as the Navy goes, the two issues were how the uh, government reached out to American businessmen. And uh, in, in, in the Navy in World War II, my two favorite stories are based around two men. Uh, the first was a guy named Henry Kaiser. And Henry Kaiser had started life in the gravel business Here's a real up from your bootstrap story. He started life in the gravel business and he became a contractor. And when the contract came up to build the Boulder Dam, now known as the Hoover Dam, uh, he really wanted it, but he didn't have enough money to pay for the bond. So he put together a consortium of, of uh, construction people across the United States and they won the contract and he delivered the Hoover Dam on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. So because of that, he developed a relationship with the the Roosevelt administration, and he started building all over the West Coast uh, shipways to shipyards and shipways to mass produce Liberty ships during World War II. And he became so famous, they did a movie about him. And when uh, uh, school uh, children were asked, who was the face that launched a thousand ships? And the teacher thinking they'd say Helen Troy, they said Henry Kaiser. So, uh, <laughs> it, so he really transformed the Navy around, but with these Liberty ships. And the other uh, story uh, is about Andrew Jackson Higgins. Now, Andrew Jackson Higgins was a guy who lived in uh, New Orleans, and he built these special shallow draft boats called Wonder Boats that, that I think were used on both sides of Prohibition. I think they were used by both smugglers to get the liquor in and by, uh, by the uh, uh, authorities trying to keep the liquor out. But he became so famous for making shallow draft landing craft, and we used 82,000 of them in World War II, that Eisenhower said that Andrew Higgins is the guy who won World War II for us, and that's why the World War II Museum is in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. because, so this is a kind of sort of all-American can-do story that are filled this side of World War II when you look at the uh, domestic homeland story of World War II. So what was Roosevelt's interaction with the decision to drop a uh, little boy and uh what was the other one called fat man yeah fat man and little boy on hiroshima and nagasaki right so roosevelt had died by then and he'd been replaced by harry truman 
But the, that story begins, I actually did a book called The Age of Radiance about the history of the nuclear era. That story begins when a group of emigre scientists started watching what was going on in Germany and realized the Germans might be developing nuclear weapons. And so they got uh, Einstein to write a letter to Roosevelt saying, we think the Germans are about to develop this bomb. We need to get on it, get on it and do one too. And that was the start of the Manhattan Project. So Roosevelt signed off on it, but he died before the actual decision to drop the bomb was made. And the decision, if you want to know more about that, uh, has to do with the fact that if we had invaded Japan to get the final victory, we, we, would have, we think we would have lost 500,000 American lives in the invasion of Japan. So to have this giant weapon to terrify people um, seemed to be a good idea, except that in reality, Japan didn't surrender because of the atomic bomb. They surrendered when Russia refused to negotiate a peace treaty between Japan and the United States, and Russia joined on to fight Japan, and that's when they decided to surrender. When Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, they were cities number 63 and 64 of the Japanese cities that had been bombed. So on the Japanese side, it didn't really make that big of a difference. At that point, there was no shipping. The island of Japan had no shipping, and its 62 city, biggest cities had been destroyed, except for Kyoto. And the reason why, because Henry Stimson had been to Kyoto on vacation, and he liked it. So he took it to on the bombing list, and now Kyoto is the one city you go to in Japan to see pre-World War II things. Uh, right. To be a general in the, in the Air Force, to be able to control that thing's. You mentioned something interesting earlier that I wanted to kind of circle back on, and you uh, you said prior to World War II, uh, the the center of power and wealth was um, England, Britain, but then afterwards it was America, and I know a lot had to do with uh, the build up to World War II as far as America's participation in it with the Lend Lease Act and whatnot. But can you describe kind of the how that transitioned, how that uh, came about? And how, well, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, and how FDR helped that to come to fruition. So in, um, uh, the, 19, in the spring of 1940, you have the Nazis taking over all of Europe, continental Europe. They take over, France falls in five weeks, uh, uh, Holland falls, Belgium falls, Luxembourg falls. So they basically have what's called Beistung Europe or Fortress Europe, where the entire continent is under their control. And now they're going to invade the Soviet Union, and now they're going to start bombing uh, England as well. And at this moment, it's really, oh, they've already taken away, uh, and oh, excuse me. Meanwhile, Japan has taken away all of the Asian colonies from the European. So the entire British, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It looked like it was going to set on all of the British Empire at that stage. There's a really incredible moment where Things look so dire that um, Canada and Australia write to Buckingham Palace and say, well, we, we know things are really bad there, so maybe you want to send the little princesses who were pr Princess Elizabeth and Margaret Rose, her sister, and they were, I think, 14 and 12, uh, to us for safeguarding. And the Queen wrote back saying that, well, the princesses won't leave without me, and I won't leave without the King, and the King will never leave. And it was almost a suicide letter because things were so bad at that time. So the United States had to come in and it had to take over the fighting of World War II because all of 1942 is like an allied disaster. And all of that period, the English are running things and for the allies, they're, they're calling the shots on strategy and almost everything they say is wrong. So for, first they lose Singapore uh, uh, and then they lose parts of the Middle East, and then they start losing their oil connection to Saudi Arabia, and then they start losing uh, all of the rest of Asia to the Japanese, and it's just one disaster after the next. And until really tort the invasion of North Africa, uh, which is something that the United States is responsible for half of, even though the English already have uh, forces there, uh, Roosevelt decides he has to take over running the war. And he decides is that he's going to have the United States be responsible for defending Australia and New Zealand, for starters. So two Commonwealth countries. And from then on, it sort of develops a sliding issue where 
the real reason we won Normandy was because of the United States. And the real reason these other successes happened was because of the United States. And frankly, the entire Asian, uh, the entire Pacific theater was our Navy winning that. The English were very, very rarely involved. So the, the, the power between the two countries completely shifted uh, in 43. So how did Roosevelt implement his strategies above everybody else's? Did he just go in and just say, I'm the boss now, you listen to me? Or was it more diplomatic or how, how did that all happen? So the starting in um, 1940, the Americans and the British started meeting together. It was called various things. The, 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 the biggest change was uh, in Canada. They met in two uh, ships at, in Canada and um, they started aligning how they were going to run the war. And everyone agreed that uh, Hitler should come first which was an idea that Americans had decided almost 10 years before in case there was a fight with America versus Japan and Germany. So the Hitler needed to be taken care of first. So everyone agreed on that. But after everything else, they really disagreed about everything, primarily about the English colonies. Uh, Britain wanted America to help them get back all of their lost colonies, such as Hong Kong and Singapore, and America wasn't going to do it because we wanted uh, the end of colonialism, and R Roosevelt was very much against it. So he would very quietly move things into place, and he would only get sort of belligerent with people, like when they would do something outrageous. Like he told um, uh, his uh, military people that he wanted to do the invasion of North Africa because they knew that they would go in and they would be able to talk the French people who were there to align themselves with the Allies, and that it would be a reasonably simple achievement. And at this point, the Americans had no real combat experience and they needed something to go in for like practice and they needed something that would be an easy achievement so that they could keep the American public uh, alongside them as they went to war. But um, Marshall and Stimson, the head of war and army, did not want to do this to the point that they were sort of belligerent about it and they seemed to be sort of conniving against it. And finally, they had a big fight between the British and the Americans where the Americans said, we're not doing North Africa. We're, in fact, we're going to turn against uh, Hitler first. We're going to do Tojo first. And this really pissed off FDR. So he said, okay, give me your Asian invasion plan right now. Give me your Pacific theater <laughs> plan right now. And this is, you know, they didn't have a Pacific theater plan, so they had to give up on that. And finally, they did get on the bandwagon for Operation Torch. And that North Africa invasion was a big success. And that was one of the turning points of the war. Okay. So we've talked about how the relationship with our, the, our relationship with the world changed. Well, what about the American society itself? How did things change inside the country? Well, of course, one of the most famous things of, to, of the homeland in World War II was Rosie the Riveter. So for those of you who have never used a rivet gun, I have. Uh, a rivet gun is like an automatic weapon in your hand that shoots bolts, okay? It is really tough. So th in 1940, to imagine women running a rivet gun was mind-boggling. It was wild. So this became sort of a famous person. First became a famous song, and then it was based on a bunch of women who really were incredible at running the rivet gun. Uh, it was the cover of magazines, and it became... But, but my favorite story about um, a working women uh, in World War II is about an 18-year-old woman who worked at a drone factory in California. Now, I didn't even know there were drones in World War II until I researched this book. So this woman was working there, and Ronald Reagan was the head of, of uh, magazines, war magazines, uh, in the home front at this time. And he sent a photographer to take pictures of beautiful women working on the assembly lines. And this guy found this woman in California and he was really taken with her. So he took two weeks off work so he could take pictures of her that she could use as a modeling portfolio. And uh, she became so famous that she could go to 20th Century Fox, get a movie contract and change her name to Marilyn Monroe. So what, besides winning the war, uh, the arsenal of democracy gave us Marilyn Monroe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Frank, the rubs about. <laughs> so to continue on, on this, how, how did Roosevelt's revolution pave the way for civil rights here in the United States? Well, there was a uh, situation 
in America at that time where the military was segregated, many things in America were, so, uh, were segregated, and black people uh, uh, developed the feeling that if they were going to fight on behalf of the country overseas, they should have a better life at home. And this became known as, like my book is V is for Victory, this became known as the double V campaign, victory overseas and victory at home. And of course, we have many, many black uh, stories of black uh, heroism in combat in World War II. But on the domestic front, the guy who um, really did a lot was a man named Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Sleeping Porters Union of the Railroad. And Randolph uh, put together a threat to um, Roosevelt that he was going to have um, half a million black people marching on Washington, D.C. If Roosevelt didn't open up hiring for black people in the war industries. And he pulled it off. And they desegregated hiring in the war industry during the course of the war. And Randolph's plan was taken up 20 years later by Martin Luther King for his march on Washington. So both the civil rights history gets started during World War II and it sort of triumphs then. So are there any other ways that Roosevelt's revolution transformed American society? So one of the things that he did that I sort of am sorry about now is that he united um, corporate America with the military and with Washington bureaucrats. And at this point, because of running the New Deal, but people in Washington, they knew how to build the Hoover Dam and the Grand Coulee Dam and the Lincoln Tunnel and the Golden Gate Bridge. And they had done these incredible um, infrastructure work in the United States. So they were used to taking on these giant projects. And since the military was coming from being 14th in size of the world, they sort of needed the inspiration of these people to believe some of these things could be done. So, for example, when when uh, Roosevelt announced that he wanted America to produce 50,000 planes a year. The people in the military thought this was the craziest thing anyone had ever said. <laughs> they couldn't even imagine that we could do such a thing. But we did that such a thing. So, and then the integration of corporate America with the military and with Washington was really the secret to producing this. It completely transformed the American economy and it completely transformed our military all for the better. So it was really a fantastically successful thing. So the two people who ran the arsenal of democracy were really interesting characters. The first one was a guy named Bill Newton, who was president of General Motors. And what Newton had done at General Motors was what Google does now, which is he got information from the salespeople and the repair people about what customers wanted and would retool Chevy. He was in charge of Chevy to fix that and answer to that. So when he came to the arts of democracy, he brought with him all of his connections with, um, you know, uh, the car industry has hundreds of thousands of subcontractors working with it. So he brought his knowledge of all of them with him. So at one point, there was a terrible problem with tanks and American tank production. We produced something like 33 tanks for the 33 years prior to World War II. And we did tens of thousands of tanks. So he brought it, he started calling around and finally he called the head of Chrysler and he said, KT, I need you to make tanks. And the head of Chrysler, KT Keller says, sure, Bill, what is a tank? <laughs> 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 the state of our military, as I said, the head of Chrysler didn't know what a tank was. So uh, Knudsen sends Chrysler to the armory where they make tanks with the army and he found out that the army was making them basically by hand, that you would have people fitting pieces together by hand. And so he brought Detroit assembly line production methods to the making of tanks and the Chrysler tank arsenal produced more tanks than all of the Germans combined. So if there was One, a tank on the battlefield, it was a Chrysler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning of that that you were sorry about how something unfolded. Can you expand on that part? Uh, well... Um, many of the people who came to Washington to help from the uh, corporate side of things, they weren't really experienced with how vicious the political fighting was. And so they would show up and they would be doing incredible jobs that they wouldn't be able to explain to people how things worked well enough to survive and they would be gotten rid of and a new guy would come in. And so uh, with um, Knudsen, the really sad story is that 
if in American industrial production, in order to move from making Chevys to making tanks, you have to redo the factory. And primarily, you have to redo the machine tools, which are the machines that make machines. I don't know if any of you watch this fantastic shows on TV called How It's Made, where you get to watch Butterfingers and, and guns and all these things being made. The, the, the machines that are making those things are called machine tools. And you have to make all your machine tools from scratch before you can then make other machines. It's like nowadays when robots make other robots and they make other robots. And Knudsen couldn't explain to the general public or people in D.C. that there is going to be this year and a half period where nothing seemed to be happening. And then things would start happening at a tremendous rate. And by, so they kicked him out and replaced him with the head of Sears, a guy named Donald Nelson, no relation. Uh, and, uh, and Nelson was able to have a more successful time at it because um, the machine tools were now in place by the time. You oh, I there. see. So let's hang out on the business side for a little bit longer. You had mentioned earlier about the New Deal. If you could go into a bit more about what the New Deal was and Roosevelt's role in that for, uh, you know, the younger listeners. So when, in 1933, when Roosevelt took office, the country had economically collapsed. It was literally the worst moment in American history. It's nothing that is going to ever happen to any of you in your lifetime is going to match the Great Depression. So people, people were out in the dumps looking for food in the dumps. They were, uh, it was one of my favorite stories, the most telling story is that a little girl is at school and she starts crying. And the teacher says, what's wrong, honey? What's happening? And she says, oh, I'm so hungry. And the teacher says, well, it's okay. You can leave school. You can go home and get something to eat. And the little girl says, I can't. It's my sister's turn to eat. Yeah, it's almost impossible to imagine how bad things were. And it was so bad that people hated Hoover, who was the president before uh, Roosevelt. But a, a great story is that um, Hoover asked an aide to borrow a nickel so we could call someone on the payphone. He said, I need to call my friend. And the aide said, here's a dime. Call both of them. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's how much he was hated uh, to bread. So, so Roosevelt comes in, and the first thing that he needs to fix is the banking situation. The 10,000 banks had failed in the United States. In some states, there were no banks, and they had taken people's life savings with them. And so what he did was he, he had uh, put aside a time at night and told everyone that he was going to tell them about the banks. And he explained to uh, America over the radio that when a bank takes your money, they don't just put it in a vault, they invest it. And that there is no reason to be frightened about how banks were investing money. And we need to go join together and defeat fear. And that night, the U.S. Treasury spent all, stayed up all night long trying to figure out where they would need to send money to, so, to shore up the banks before the rest of them failed. But in the morning, they found out that in fact, Americans had so been taken by Roosevelt's speech on the radio that they weren't taking their money out anymore. That in fact, they were putting their money into banks. And this became the fireside chat that Roosevelt would use time and again when he wanted to talk to the public. So let's get towards the end of the war. So how did his vision for after World War II differ from, you know, the other allied leaders? And how did this, you know, shape the outcome of the war? Well, World War I ended with people trying to take revenge on Germany and really making the Germans suffer. And they went so far in that direction that we ended up with Hitler. And Roosevelt wanted to make sure that that didn't happen again. He really believed that the Treaty of Versailles was responsible for Hitler. So he wanted to create a situation where everyone felt that they were being treated fairly. And he wanted everyone to be able to benefit financially from the success of World War II. So he came up with things like the United Nations and uh, the Global Bank and the Global Monetary Fund and various other things to try and not have this kind of fire point appear again. And you can say that he was successful because we haven't had World War III in 80 years. So far. It's so far. <laughs> <laughs> so what were the major challenges that Roosevelt faced during the war and how, how did he overcome them? The major problem was that the uh, heads, uh, uh, well, I guess the way to understand it is we now know 
uh, the heads of the American military in World War II as being great men. But they didn't start out the war as great men. <laughs> they didn't really know what they were doing yet. And they were making a lot of errors. And because of that, there was a stagnation that set in where nothing seemed to be happening, just like with the production. And Roosevelt had to keep the American public engaged with this process, or they would vote everyone out and the war would be, you know, we wouldn't be fighting the war anymore. So, uh, and he had a lot of fights with uh, uh, the ge various generals and admirals over this point, so, such that uh, uh, George Marshall said in his memoirs, uh, we learned that the president's job during the war is to keep the public entertained. That's not a quiet word for it, but it's something like that. And that isn't really the idea, but the, the generals and admirals didn't understand the politics necessary to keep them in business, really. And they felt that they could act without any thought to what the American public thought. And Roosevelt had to keep uh, all these forces in line. So what about some of the criticisms that have been leveled against Roosevelt and his wartime leadership and policies? Well, the, the biggest problem was that they needed to work out logistics. And at the start of the war, they had very bad logistics. And by the end of the war, they had invented logistics. But so the sort of coordination of effort from manufacturing and shipping and transformation and transportation out of the hundreds of thousands of things that needed to be used to fight the war uh, had terrible coordination problems. And his biggest political fallout was in trying to get all these things moving in the right direction. Uh, the other issue is that they needed about a year and a half for the arsenal of democracy to get up into full force before we could really do anything. And basically the way that they did that was because the Germans were so busy fighting the Soviets that they stopped trying to fight us for about a year. And that's how that worked out. <laughs> so a lot, some of it was luck. So what lessons do you think we can draw from Roosevelt's leadership and the American experience in World War II that are relevant to today's challenges and crises? Well, I think the first thing is that if anyone thinks things are so terrible now, they just have to look at this history and feel better because things were much worse then and everything turned out okay for these guys. Uh, uh, secondly, now we have a situation where politicians don't argue um, between each other. They just talk to their base. So you aren't having the situation. So the, one of the amazing things in this story is to see Roosevelt and Lindbergh debating each other on the radio, sort of trading speeches on the radio. And the American public is listening in and they become actually involved in how foreign policy is going, what laws are being changed, what we're doing to uh, fight the war. Uh, and so you really see the American uh, democratic operation in operation, and it really worked. And so it would be nice to get back to uh, Democrats and Republicans arguing against each other instead of only talking to their own fans. And that's one of the nice things to see in this story, to see that people can have these profound differences of opinion and that it could all work out in the end. Krista, anything from you? Because we went through my list so much quicker than I thought we were going to. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. There were a couple of things. I think that the last thing that you mentioned, I found interesting because today there is a lot of division. And do you think FDR had uh, an advantage per se, given that there was um, there were more common enemies to the totality of the American people that he, he could kind of rally everyone towards? Yes, it, because of this existential threat, the United States did uh, unite because they really faced an invasion. The, the incredible moment where the uh, army is, is insisting that we're not going to fight in Europe. We're just going to defend the Western Hemisphere. We don't need to go take part in any European foreign wars again, like World War One. We're just going to defend the Western Hemisphere. And then when France falls and they realize that the Nazis might actually show up in the Western Hemisphere, they realize they don't have enough troops to defend the Western Hemisphere. So this point that they'd been making for two years uh, ends up being completely not true, that they needed to go out there. Uh, but and, and Roosevelt was the first person to talk about American security as extending beyond our borders, that we need to be involved in what goes on overseas. We can't wait for uh, evil to show up at our ports. 
we have to be involved in, in, in security and in national security. But you're absolutely right. It was this existential threat that united people. But however, he handled it in a way where it wasn't that suddenly we're fighting World War II. He took almost a year and a half and took step by step more and more helping Britain and France and then the Soviet Union. First with uh, giving trading destroyers for bases in the Caribbean, then by using cash carry so that people could buy things from us, and finally by lend lease where we were shipping things. And both of these, all of this process, both um, kept American lives out of the war before Pearl Harbor, but made the American co economy boom at the same time it was helping to fight Hitler. You mentioned um, kind of a mindset shift in America. I know um, based on some of the speeches of the earlier presidents, uh, Washington in particular, who comes to mind, is that we shouldn't involve ourselves in, in foreign wars or just try. There was a, a much greater isolationism prior to this. Uh, do you think FDR would be the primary... I guess, catalyst to changing that mindset? Uh, no, because there was Spanish-American before that, and there, there were various other issues. The, the, the real twist in this story is that Americans were very isolated and timid and leave me alone and don't bother me, and I don't want to be involved in that. And, and sort of, uh, they had like a self-esteem problem. They really thought of themselves as being these sort of uh, little farming people who didn't really weren't sophisticated enough to be involved in this stuff and stuff and, and and the change is that he got Americans to believe in themselves again. There's a there's a really incredible moment where uh, in his first term he spends uh, what's called the hundred days, and he passes all of this legislation to fix every single thing that's wrong with the country. And one congressman said it was like reading the first book of Genesis. This legislation, because it was so huge and so profound and so incredible. And after it was all passed, um, uh, Roosevelt, who's paralyzed from polio, rents a sailing boat and takes his family sailing from Washington back up to Campobello, which everyone in America knows is where he got polio. And this sort of incredible burst of, we've defeated this, we're winning, we're on our way, that he does with this simple act. You can see it transforming American thinking. All of a sudden, we can do things, and we are capable, and we can get together and change things, and everything could be better. And you see this transformation happening uh, in both the radio and the press and in people's lives. Um, I know you mentioned polio, and I think um, from what I understand, not many of the American public realized he uh, suffered through polio, although polio was common enough that some everyone pretty much knew somebody that had it. Uh, but specifically, I know there was a period prior to his governorship of New York where he's, he suffered dramatically a lot of health issues and really came back and um, launched a, a pretty significant political career. Um, Americans generally like an underdog story, come from behind story. Um, was this common knowledge back then, or what was the view of FDR's uh, ability to bounce back? Everybody knew that he had polio okay. and that he had trouble with his legs, but they didn't know how serious it was. In the FDR library, there are only three pictures of him in a wheelchair, and he spent his entire life in a wheelchair after the age of, I think it was 28. Uh, so uh, they did an incredible job of pretending that he wasn't paralyzed. And one of the things he did, which is sort of incredible, if you think about a gymnast on the parallel bars moving forward with just his hands, this is how he pretended to walk. He, would, he, he had his legs strapped into steel braces to hold them rigid, uh, 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 like uh, walking on sticks. And then he would hold the arm of an aide and have a cane, and he would basically tilt back and forth on these sticks to look like he was walking. And it was, and it took incredible training and physical effort to do this. He's carrying his entire body on his arms and then sauntering back and forth with his hips to look like he's walking. And the, he also counteracted uh, being paralyzed by having a, a, a network of secret spies. One of them was Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS. Uh, another one was uh, Edward R. Murrow, the newscaster in London for CBS. And the most famous one was Eleanor Roosevelt, who 
you know, people have remember now is this grandmotherly do-cutter. She was really more like a ninja. And Eleanor would go around the country and she would go where he couldn't go because he was paralyzed and she, he would report back. And one of my favorite stories, and this really astonished me. So when he's running for president in 1933, a guy tries to kill him in Miami and he misses and instead shoots the mayor of Chicago and kills the mayor of Chicago, but he almost died. So when Eleanor and Franklin go into the White House, the, everyone is very worried about her security and she announces, I will not be taken care of by the Secret Service, by any police. I'm going to take care of myself. And she did. She always had a gun in her purse. So I was a little astonished to learn that because we think of her as such a this sweet marshmallow type of a person. And it's it. Eleanor Roosevelt always had a gun in her purse. Nice. That's fascinating. So him being in a wheelchair since 28, did that have, was he doing anything with the ADA at that time to try to change, uh, laws to help the physically disabled? Well, he, uh, the people believe that you could uh, fix yourself by floating in hot water. So he found this place called hot springs, uh, Georgia that he developed so that people who were paralyzed could go there and try helping themselves because it was a hot water, hot, hot springs resort. And at Georgia, he got, uh, Henry Ford's son, Edsel, to help donate, to help build facilities there. And he turned it into this rehabilitation center. And that turned into the program for uh, polio uh, research. And that became the March of Dimes. And that became the system that almost com has almost completely defeated polio in the world. Polio's almost gone. So the next time you pull... Oh, pull a dime out of your pocket and see FDR's face there. You can remember this story that out of this horrible thing that happened to him, he's now almost defeated polio with his legacy. Anything else, Christoph? Uh, yeah, there was one thing. It's actually toward the beginning, almost as a footnote in your book, which I really enjoyed. Um, there was a talk about how FDR oversaw the, the change of gold prices uh, partway through his administration. And he, he raised the price by 21 cents because that was his, it was lucky. That, that seems yeah. very capricious and um, like they would have ramifications that would be further than um, the seriousness that with which it should have been done. Can you talk a little bit about some of those decisions or maybe some things that may not have been as well thought out? I know it, logistically, like you were saying, from a World War II perspective, he was a great leader, but that, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Well, I think it's, you were right to be rubbed the wrong way. I think that, uh, he was this very quirky, odd person in a lot of ways. I mean, he raised, he, he was a rich man. His, his sled as a child was Napoleon the Third sled. But at the same time, he grew Christmas trees on his property. And he was very intent that people buy his Christmas trees. So they sort of made sure that uh, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue and the major retailers bought presidential Christmas trees for the holiday. And, and, and he could be a very odd person. He uh, got really mad when, he, when a senator misquoted him. So we had the first White House taping system installed. This is a long time before Nixon. Uh, and, and he had it so that he could control it by a switch and a lamp and he could turn the taping on and off. And we only have a couple of these tapes left because after a while he decided that Maybe it wasn't a good idea to have a tape recorder running all the time. <laughs> so, and, and one of the people who's written about him the most uh, said that uh, going to visit Roosevelt in the White House was like going to visit a spider in its den. So he did have a, a very mixed reputation during his lifetime. I like to say that he's the greatest politician in American history. And I mean that in all senses of the word. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, the, one of my favorite things is that one, a number of people suddenly realized that the Roosevelt they knew wasn't the real Roosevelt, that he had developed this persona that he put on like an act, sort of like Reagan. And, and they kept trying to find out who was the real Roosevelt behind this guy, that, this theater production that they saw, but they could never find him. I find that fascinating. Uh, also, uh, as a tidbit, I heard that uh, FDR is one of only two presidents to have a tattoo. Do you know if that's accurate? I do not know. Okay. Uh, just, I had heard that both he and Theodore Roosevelt had tattoos on their chest of their family crest. And I find that, I found that uh, pretty fascinating. 
I, I've no, the only, I've only seen <laughs> pictures of him in a, 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 when he goes swimming, he leaves his shirt on. So I've never seen what that tattoo might be, <laughs> but I've never seen a tattoo on that. Uh, however, I do have to say that Theodore Roosevelt was, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's guiding light. And, and historians have gotten this big attempt to make a big difference between the two of them. But actually, they were incredibly similar. Uh, Franklin even started wearing the pant-nay eyeglasses that Theodore wore. And he followed Theodore almost foot, step, footstep for footstep in politics. And even the New Deal, which people thought was so radical, was based on a speech Theodore had given during his last presidential campaign. So the two of them were really united. Franklin thought Theodore was the greatest man he'd ever met. And, and they were very, very close politically. In a lot. Well, I have no additional questions. I really, um, I, I think I need to reread the book. Uh, there were lots of little things that popped out at me, but uh, I didn't really get probably the full thrust of what you've written. And I really appreciate you writing the book and, and visiting us. It's been great, guys. Thank you so much. I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry, Dale. No, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I'll, I'll beat you up later. Don't worry about it. Excellent. Yes, good. <laughs> Is there anything, Craig, that you would like to say before we go? Anything you want to uh, say to our listeners? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we historians like to say that we have a little joke that everyone who thinks that the way things are going now is terrible and that the past was a golden age doesn't know enough history. Uh, so anytime you feel bad about the way things are going in your life, just pick up a nice history book and you'll feel better in 20 pages. All right. Thank you for joining us. You guys can uh, pick up Craig's Nelson's book, V is for Victory, at, I assume, any retailer <laughs> where books are sold. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and leave you now, and we're going to wish you all a fair winds and following seas. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. U.S. Naval History Podcast, departing. 